You've looked in the bulletin and seen that the title of this presentation is Donkeys. Donkey times three. We won't go into any personal memories, but my father liked the figure of a donkey. And he liked it so much that he often referred to me as a donkey. And so remembering that, no, no, don't, don't be going amen back there. <laughs> <laughs> remembering that some time back, I began to do a little study on donkeys. And I discovered that there are <clears throat> over 140 mentions of donkeys in the Bible. So they must be important. We're not going to look at all 140 of them, by the way. In our Western society, the donkey is not considered to be a beautiful animal it would likely be included in a list of foolish things referred to in the scripture for today. Now the donkey has a voice, but the noise that it makes when talking is at best comical. It certainly is not melodious. We wouldn't invite him up here to duet with our special music. The donkey's temperament leaves a lot to be dis dis desired. Descriptors like stubborn, cranky, difficult are frequently used. So why would God choose a donkey to teach us some lessons? Often a lesson is easier to remember when the object used to present it is wildly memorable. We're only going to look at three donkeys. Numbers 22. Now if you remember the last quarter's lessons, Numbers 22, the Israelites are on the border of the promised land. They're getting ready to go across. They are in the process of entering Canaan. And here in Numbers 22, we meet our first donkey. Initially, it doesn't seem like we're going to be looking at a donkey because it talks about a prophet named Balaam. Balaam had once been a true prophet of Jehovah. However, something happened and he determined that he wanted wealth. He wanted power. And he wanted to be recognized for who he was. After all, he was special. So he let it be known that he would prophesy for a price. One of the Canaanite kings heard about that and hired Balaam for a pretty nice amount of money. And Balaam was to meet this king up on top of a mountain overlooking the Israel encampment. Balaam had chosen to go to the highest bidder, but in this case it was the only bidder. His prophecies, his blessings, his predictions of doom, he felt confident in using for this purpose. And he had been hired by this Canaanite king to prophesy over the Israelite camp a prophecy of doom. He was to speak a curse on the Israelites. And the Canaanite leader had chosen a particular place that was advantageous for looking over their encampment and Balaam was to meet him there. It's up on a mountain so that meant climbing the sides of the mountain to get up there. Balaam had a donkey. It was a trustworthy donkey. 
It was loyal, had been very dependable for him all of his life. And so Balaam started out on his donkey to meet the Canaanite leader. We meet Balaam partway up the mountain. The Canaanite king is up there waiting for him. And Balaam is intent on getting this job done so he could collect the reward. But suddenly, something changed. He was doing the typical and kicking the donkey in the side in order to get him to go a little bit faster when the donkey stopped, wouldn't go. Well, that didn't please the master at all, and so he did the kick him in the side and had his foot up here and the donkey began moving to the right and on the right was this solid rock wall where the path had been worked out and Balaam's foot was crushed between the donkey and the wall. This did not please the master. And he responded to the donkey with angry words and took out his riding crop and began beating the donkey, either on the back or the head, but began beating the donkey. And again, suddenly, something miraculous happened, something that you wouldn't expect. We heard a story about a cat here. <clears throat> well, what if your cat all of a sudden began talking to you telling you I'm ready to eat lunch now and I think you ought to fix me something. I didn't like what I had for supper last night, so don't do that again. You'd be kind of surprised at your cat doing that. <clears throat> but that's what happened here. Balaam's donkey began talking to him, not just in words here and there, but in complete sentences in Balaam's Jewish tongue, language, and using the correct syntax for all of those sentences that he was saying. The donkey called its owner out for treating him unfairly. Now, okay, we've read stories and we've seen Disney and, and that so that the donkey talking might not be quite so uh, unusual for us. But way back then, if you had been Balaam sitting on the donkey, I think you'd have been rather puzzled. But Balaam didn't seem to think it was anything out of the ordinary. Instead, he turned to the donkey, looked him square in the eyes and said, what, I'm sorry, looked him square in the eyes and the donkey spoke back to him. And the donkey said, what have I done to you to cause you to treat me like this? For years I have carried your burdens. I have even carried you up this mountain. I have a history of faithfulness. Have I broken my agreement with you to serve you? Have I ever done anything to cause you trouble or hurt? Pretty long message for the donkey to give. The interesting thing right after that is that Balaam didn't seem to think it was unusual. He simply responded back to the donkey as if the donkey has been speaking, but we can tell from our vantage point that this was God speaking to Balaam through the donkey. We might put this in today's language. Uh, I call, I want to get a message to my wife, and so I call my wife on my cell phone, and she pick, has her cell phone, but she is busy talking to somebody on that phone at the time that I call, and so it gets the busy signal, and uh, I don't like that. I need to get this message to her, and so what do I do? I think of who might be with her, and I call their cell phone to get a message to her, okay? So let's think about this. Balaam's cell phone was out of service. It was busy. So God delivered the message through the donkey's voicemail. And Balaam got the message. 
He has to admit that the animal has done nothing to deserve the treatment he is receiving at his hand, but remember who was talking to him, and so in doing this, he is admitting that God has done nothing to deserve being treated as Balaam is treating him. And then Balaam's vision is turned on. And he can see the angel warrior standing in the path ahead with a drawn sword. And he begins to understand why the donkey has been behaving as it was. He begins to understand God's displeasure with the mission he is on. And despite that, what do we find happens next? Balaam spurs the donkey on and works in between the angel and the wall of the mountain here and goes ahead to his meeting with the king. There's a lesson in here for us. There's a couple of them. God is going to get the message through to us. Even if we aren't listening, there's going to be a message. And it's up to us to pay attention. But we also look at Balaam using the cloak of God's message or being God's messenger in order to gain riches or fame is abusing God. And that's what Balaam was doing here. The wealth of the universe is in God's bank. But the focus of a messenger on God's mission will not be wealth or favor from men. And neither will it be that God's messenger will shape the message to gain men's approval or a position among the world's elite. Do we have opportunity of being a messenger for God at times? Yes, each one of us does. Even a casual reading of the Bible shows us that God is the victor and Satan is destined to lose the war. Those standing with the victorious will have worked for God, walked with God without regard for wealth or honor. As in this event, God goes to great efforts to get us to see and understand where we are in relationship to where he wants us to be. Sometimes speaking through things that normally don't have a voice. It's better to be the donkey than a wealthy former spokesperson for God. And so if you can remember one thing from today, I hope you can remember three, remember Balaam's donkey. Don't be him except that he did allow God to speak through him. Donkey number two, Judges 15. We move along a little bit here. The Israelites have already moved into Canaan now. And um, <clears throat> we find another time of the judges. Remember, they didn't have a king at this time, so there were judges. Israel has become content with the relationships that they have with the inhabitants of Canaan. And at this particular time, Samson is the judge that was chosen by God. And even Samson has been toying with the task of removing the Canaanites from the occupied territory. As the judge, that was his job. Get the Canaanites removed from the promised land. The leaders of the various groups of Israelites living in this promised land have developed a working relationship with the Canaanite inhabitants that have been left there. And that relationship was, you don't bother us, we don't bother you. That was not the plan that God laid out for them. Then came Samson onto the scene. He was not the first judge, but he came onto the scene. And it didn't take long for him to develop an amazing reputation as a mighty warrior. The Canaanite leaders quickly have had enough of Samson's exploits. And it has gotten to the point where their soldiers refuse to carry out any mission involving Samson. Certainly they are not going to attempt a frontal assault on Samson because 
Others have tried that, and it ended as a disaster. So they devise a plan. Again, it's the, the Israelite leaders have been contacted by the Canaanites, and they have agreed to a plan to get rid of Samson. This was the plan. The military is to deliver Samson to them at a predetermined location, desolate desert, where there are no settlers and no towns. 3,000 men are chosen from the Israelite army, from the tribe of Judah. They were all fighting men. They were experienced soldiers. And they were the ones to whom Samson was entrusted. They were told... In Operation Desert Deliverance, to take Samson to a particular place and leave him there and escape. 3,000 Hebrew fighters. That's 10 times as many as the soldiers that routed the entire enemy under Gideon, all because of Samson. Delivering after delivering Samson to the agreed-on location, these mighty men of valor withdrew to the surrounding bluffs and settled down to see the show. They didn't have long to wait. As the Canaanite military began creeping toward the rock where Samson had been left, they began closing rank and created an impenetrable circle ever tightening around Samson. And so Samson, brushing off the ropes that had bound him, he knelt down and he began feeling around in the dirt. He was looking for something that could be used as a weapon. His fingers soon closed around the jawbone of an unfortunate donkey that had succumbed to the desert conditions many months prior to this day. And he grabbed up that jawbone. Who would have thought that God would use a dried out bone from a lost donkey that had died in the desert in order to teach, teach his chosen people lessons in being loyal followers of God's way. Reading this story in the Old Testament, it's very interesting. Samson picked up the jawbone, faced the enemy. I don't know how that's what the words are, but I don't know because it was a circle, but so maybe he would kept turning. But he picked up that jawbone and he faced the enemy, and the enemy slowly advanced. The first one to get there, close enough for him to reach, received a nice strong clout with the jawbone. Over the next four hours, 1,000 of the Canaanite warriors were killed by one man using a jawbone. 1,000 enemy soldiers could not break through Samson's defenses. The Philistine soldiers kept pushing toward Samson, ignoring the ones that they were having to climb over in order to get there. But when they got there, they joined the ones on the ground. I did a little math, I like math, did a little math, a thousand soldiers, got one thing in one hand. If a Philistine soldier was killed every 15 seconds, it would take four hours and 10 minutes to kill a thousand. And all of this time, here is Samson just, just working, no breaks, no water, no ready-to-eat meals. Now, I can tell you that my mother did not like these stories. We often skipped over these as we were doing our Bible studies at home. She didn't like these stories. And it is kind of, I mean, when you break it down, 15 seconds, every 15 seconds he's killing something. Wow, is that God's plan? I can't tell you why God was using war events to secure the promised land for his chosen people. Oh wait, actually I can. I can tell you why. 
It's because the people of God were not following the instructions that he had given to them first. Every reasonable effort was used by God to convince his chosen people to trust and obey. And how did they respond? But I can promise you this. When we get to the end, heaven, when we get to heaven, we can look back at the history of this world moving through and we will be satisfied that God is both fair and compassionate. At least take that away with you today. God is both fair and compassionate with us today. In this episode, God was speaking to his people through the dried out jawbone of a donkey in the hands of a chosen judge. And he was saying, look what I can do with one man and this simple fighting tool. He speaks to us today through that experience with Samson and other ways. When we allow the Spirit of God to enter our lives, no matter what the talent, skills, or tools are that we have, that I have, it is kind of important that we put this in the first person. It's, it's easy for you to sit there and say that he has, pointing at me, and it's easy for me up here to say that you, so let's get personal with it. No matter what the talents, skills, experiences that I have, God will work with me to destroy the enemy. Today, what is the enemy? Temptation and sin. Just as he worked with Samson and the jawbone. If Israel had joined in after this battle and had cooperated with Samson, their judge, and God, the Philistines would have been completely destroyed. Just think what a difference that would have made just in Samson's life. He went through, remember the later part of his life and how he died? If they had cooperated, that would not have been the history that we would look at. It was a powerful jawbone, but it was a powerful message that God was wanting to get to us also. If a, church, if a person chooses to remain deaf to what is being said, even when the message comes through a miracle, a friend, or a powerful preacher, the message will not be understood, nor will it be accepted if we choose to remain deaf. Here was a powerful evidence of God working through his chosen, fighting for them, giving them the opportunity to respond. But God's people went back to their jobs and their amusements and their fake gods and thought about adding donkey jawbones to their list of deities. But Samson... After four hours of strenuous work in the hot desert sun in the heat of the day with no water, no food, Samson suddenly realizes that he is about to faint from dehydration. No water is available in this place. He is too weak to travel to the nearest town that has a water supply. Samson looks at what he knows about himself and what he knows about God. He's too weak to travel and God can help him. In desperation, he turns to God. Tossing the bloody jawbone aside, casually, he seeks God's help. Acknowledging that he, Samson, is helpless, and he begs for water from him. And then he begins looking around, and as Samson looks around, his eyes are drawn to the place where that jawbone landed over here on some rocks. It had landed on a rocky ledge beside a hollow depression in the rock. And as he looks, miraculously, water flows from the jawbone and fills that depression and creates a stream in a place where there had not been a stream before. And Samson is able to get a drink. God is trying to make this easy for Samson to comprehend 
the jawbone and the water together, calling to Samson to realize that both of these victories were from God. Victorious living and the water of life are available only through dependence on God. If any person thirst, no age requirements, if any person thirst, let him come to me and drink freely so that the water will be in him and her, a spring of water flowing out, leading to everlasting life. And for Samson, this was proof that both his strength and the water came from God. It spoke of his mission as the judge over Israel. God also speaks to us today, not necessarily with a jawbone, and I'm not about to be doing any fancy legwork up here. Not always with a miracle, but always with unmistakable evidences of who is working through us. Victory with God is guaranteed. Donkey number three. What was the first donkey? Balaam. Second donkey, just the jawbone. Now ba donkey number three. We've likely all seen the results when a person tries to ride an unbroken colt. Actually, you can see it on TV quite regularly where they have these get-togethers get with cowboys and all that kind of stuff, riding a bronco. Bronco busting is a great sport for spectators. A donkey colt is no different from those other colts. And the fact is you don't ride for very long if you climb on the back of a donkey colt. Yet, Jesus chose an unbroken colt on which to ride into Jerusalem near the close of his earthly ministry. The disciples were probably not silent about the fact that they had brought to Jesus this colt that had never before been ridden. The fact was emphasized in the Bible. Each of the four Gospels contains this story and this information. And so I'm guessing that the disciples were making sure that the crowd knew that this is an unbroken cult that we're bringing here. Who but the Creator, the Messiah, the Savior, could take an unbroken cult and ride it peacefully into town? Who but God can subdue the donkey tendencies in us and direct us to the new Jerusalem? The donkey cult submitted to the master and walked quietly, peacefully, maybe even proudly on its mission. The universe watched as the Creator rode into Jerusalem. Who but Jesus? can take our bucking, fighting, get off my back and leave me alone donkeyness and give us the peace to walk in the path toward the cross. Who but Jesus, the Creator, can take the simple, foolish donkey of a person that I am and make me a son of God. Verse 27 of 1 Corinthians 1, God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God is speaking to you today. It will probably be through a simple tool, a speaker at church, a Sabbath school lesson, something later during the week at work or play. The message that he gives you may be one of the ones we have looked at today. Three, Balaam's donkey message, I am faithful. My love doesn't change even when you turn your back on what I have asked you to do. It's good to be a donkey voice that points out and encourages loyalty to God. Number two, the jawbone weapon message. I am the victory that you need over every sin, over every habit, and I provide the water of life. Be a tool in the hand of God's chosen to get God's work done. That's our opportunity. 
Number three, the unbroken cult message. I am your Messiah King. It's up to me to be the willing burden bearer who carries Jesus to those who need a savior. The warning is clear. If a person chooses to remain deaf to what is being said, whether the message comes from nature, a miracle, a friend, the Bible, the result is separation from God. The promise is sure. Come unto me and I will give you rest. He that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. What is your response today? You must respond. It cannot be avoided. Do you say, all to Jesus I surrender? Or do you protest that it's not a real convenient time right now? One response leads to life. The other doesn't. At three critical times in the history of God's chosen people, God used a donkey to speak for him. Today, he can use donkeys and even people who may be somewhat like a donkey. The promise is certain. There is no limit to what can be accomplished by one who, putting self aside, allows the Holy Spirit to work through him or her. As for me, my faith has found a resting place. It is enough that Jesus died and that he rose again for me. What about you? Would you close your eyes just now and pray with me? Heavenly Father, my Father, the one who can make donkeys talk and can speak through bones, springs of water, and gentle colts, I acknowledge you as my faithful, victorious Messiah King right now. I want you in my life. I want to hear you speaking to me and through me. Thank you for making me your child. Amen. We'll turn to our closing hymn now.